Today on the We Invested podcast, we have Marty Greenbaum, and he is the founder and CEO of Smart Franchise Investing. Marty, how are you doing today? Awesome, Leslie. Doing great. Thanks for having me on today. I'm looking forward to a great, great podcast today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And before we get started, um, would you mind letting the people know how they can find you on the internet or social media or website? Oh, you bet. You bet. Thank you. Well, listen, my website, smartfranchiseinvesting.com is the best place to find me, smartfranchiseinvesting.com. So you'll you'll easily find that site. Incredible. Incredible. So, you know, let's just kind of start from the top and talk a little bit about, you know, uh, where you're from and where you grew up. Oh, well, listen, I uh, I grew up in Chicago, grew up in the north side of Chicago, uh, there for 16 years of my life. Love Chicago, definitely love Chicago. And then my family, because my dad had an opportunity, we mo moved out to Las Vegas. Uh, I moved out in 1979. So now I live in what they call Henderson, Nevada, which is pretty much a southern suburb of Las Vegas and uh, been here ever since. I'm 59 years old. I can't believe it. You know, so I've been here obviously a long time, seen, seen a lot of change in Las Vegas. That's that's for sure. And you know, moving from Chicago to Las Vegas at the age of 16, that's like a time, a very important timeline, uh, adolescence and, and just um, growing up in it, it shapes that at that moment in time, the things around you really shape who you are and, and, and what you become. So was it a tough transition moving from Chicago to Vegas at that age, at that moment? Uh, it was terrible. I uh, didn't want to do it, of course. I ended up, this is a funny story, I ended up driving here with my brother at uh, through an uh, ice storm. We slid off the road, you know, so we drew, drew, drove straight through 32 hours in an ice storm in the winter to meet up with our parents, you know, but my in a 1972 Carmen Ghia with a pit bull in the back. That was a crazy experience. And then like an hour and a half out of town, we had a problem with the axle and it broke. We're an hour and a half, you know, from being in Vegas after all that drive, first time driving out, you know, with my brother who was a little bit older than me, a couple of years older, and it was a crazy experience and our axle broke. So long story uh, short, we made it. Uh, I, I had to transfer high schools, which I wasn't happy about and get reacclimated. Uh, but I ended up doing okay and went to UNLV, um, which is a very, you know, uh, well-recognized school and ended up with a degree in hotel marketing. So uh, my my background started with a hotel marketing degree, um, which actually makes sense for, you know, where I've been. No, exactly. And it's incredible. And, you know, before we started recording, we were just talking about, you um, you know, living in Vegas, kind of what it's like and how you've seen it grow and, and just expand from, you know, 79 up until now. Um, I know for me living in Vegas, it was it was a huge culture shock coming from North Carolina, but it was also inspiring just to see the theatrics of the city. Like everything was a show. Everything was a rollout. Well, you know, back then it was trip. Yeah, back then it was even more crazy. I'll tell you. I remember the first time I drove down the strip and all the lights. I mean, if you've never been, it just blows you away the the it, you know, the grandeur of it all. It's crazy, you know. But back then too, there was still hookers walking the streets. It was crazy yeah. in that regard. I mean, yeah. you wouldn't believe it. If you've seen Casino, the movie, that's kind of you know what it was like. And all the hotels that you don't see anymore, they were all there, you know, the stardust the landmark the hacienda i mean back then it was such a different place and so so much smaller um so it was really neat growing up here it was a little bit crazy growing up here i had a lot of fun going to unlv and uh i was in a fraternity at unlv so we had a lot of fun you know so uh but you know listen time goes on and uh just focus on family focus on your business you know that's what that's what i've been up to Exactly. Exactly. I mean, and, and just before we before we um, transition over to your current company, I want to ask, you know, how did growing up in Vegas impact your outlook on life and success? 
Well, listen, I, uh, I, I was never one to, you know, get into that whole big party scene too hard, you know, and go out and hit the casinos. I've seen a lot of people get lost in all that, you know, so you either stay away from that and do well, or you get lost in all that. So Vegas is a little bit different town to grow up in, right? And, uh, you know, listen, there's been some great people that, you know, started in Vegas. It is an entre very entrepreneurial town, okay? And listen, when I had a business here, I, I actually was, um, I was on the uh, board of the Chamber of Commerce for some time. I chaired the board of the American Heart Association here in Las Vegas for two years. I was on the board of six years. So, you know, listen, um, if you take advantage of certain things in any community, especially one like Las Vegas, which was growing fast and a lot of commerce has come here, you know, outside, even outside of the casino, you know, business, it's a, it's a regular town. So, you know, you just got to stay away from all that crazy stuff, because if you do, you're going to be better off. So, uh, so I don't know how much that influenced me that much, uh, because I always stayed focused on goals, you know? Exactly. And this is a lot of distractions in Vegas, but staying focused, if you can stay focused in Vegas, I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's really the key to success. Um, but, you know, just kind of moving forward and focusing on the company that you've created and that you're building now, I want to ask, what is smart franchise investing? Well, listen, uh, in a nutshell, what I do is I help people learn about franchising, about business ownership and really franchising, you know, because so many people out there, um, there's so many reasons why it kind of starts with why people look to find a business, right? So, you know, basically what we do is we help people determine if business ownership is for them but we also help them understand franchising and look at franchising and saying, okay, what do I need to know if I get into franchise ownership? How do I evaluate a franchise? What do I do before I buy? You know, what do I need to know? And I will get in, we could get into a little more details on that, you know, but what I do is I help them take a really good look at franchising and all the different types of franchises out there because there's thousands and help them identify those franchises that could be the best fit for them. So they're not just blindly picking something that they think will be good, but we're really going into it and 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 getting into the into the weeds about what they're looking to accomplish and how we can match them with a franchise that make totally makes sense for them. So that's what we do. We help people you know as as really consultants, educators and matchmaker to uh in the franchise space i remember uh when i was in college for i think three years i worked at a subway and there was an owner that owned a subway on campus and then he owned one maybe about five or ten miles away from campus and i used to talk to him about it and uh that's kind of how i got introduced into into the world of franchising and i, I know it was something i was really interested in and something i really wanted to do because it it just seemed it, I was like a night manager and I could see how profitable we were for the day and, and going over inventory and counting the drawers. So I knew like, man, this is a really profitable business to be in. And um, it's it's a great avenue to build wealth and to create a, a good stream of cash flow. Um, so that that's, franchising is something that's always been interesting to me personally. Well, let me just say this. Um... There's a statistic out there that 80% of people that start new businesses fail within the first five years. 80% mm -hmm. of franchise owners are still in business after five years. Okay. So the thing is in any business, you know, it's great to have a great business, but you have to really understand all the aspects of the business. And most people going into business, they don't really know what it's going to take because they've oftentimes never got into that business. How many people start restaurants thinking like, oh, I always wanted to have a restaurant or a coffee shop, but, and they do their best. They're smart people going into business, doing their research, doing their best. But imagine if you got with a franchise system that has brand equity, you know, that, that people know 
when they walk in the doors, just like when they walk into a subway, what what can I expect if I get a sandwich? What can I expect with the service? What can I? What's that customer experience going to be like? And and a do I like that? And b I always look at franchising. You know, also what value do you get as a customer, right? But you know, people buy into franchising because there's a the brand, a proven business model, support, training, technology, marketing, and so on. But just think, if you have a business model where there's 300 franchisees operating the same business model in a very similar way because they're standards, right? And the, the franchisor over the years has continued to make improvements in every aspect of the business because it's in their best interest to do so, to help franchisees succeed. And then you have 300 franchise owners that are also looking at this business and saying, how do we do better? How do we make more improvements? Every, again, is it better marketing? Do we need different technology? Do we need you know, to be smarter when we pick locations? Whatever that may look like, franchising, because of all that, because of all this attention on really distilling down this model to the most profitable version of the model. That's what differentiates independent businesses from franchises. And that's why franchising makes sense because you have this, you know, help to get into the business. You don't have to have experience, you know, to get into it. And you have this ongoing support and ongoing refinement. And you have a family of other franchise owners that you could even make friends with and share best practices. So there's a lot into franchising goes into this model and why, you know, someone would buy a Subway uh, instead of opening up Bob's, you know, sub shop, right? 1000%. So, you know, how did you get started in this industry? Like what, what gave you that spark and that interest to want to learn about, you know, the world of franchising and, and, and get involved? It's a crazy story, I'll be honest with you. My father and one of his buddies started a uh, a business opening up what I'm going to call like postal mail centers. Maybe you're familiar with like UPS store, but mm -hmm. many people um, would be familiar with a brand called PostNet. They're very similar. OK, and it's a you know shipping and packaging business where they offer printing and copying and private mailboxes and packaging supplies and other what I'm going to call business services. So my family started that and that business eventually became PostNet. Um, and I was involved in a family franchise business for eight years and I opened up about 500 stores. So I started my really my career when I got done with college in the family franchise business. And I was first in operations, opening stores. And then I moved into marketing because that's what I earned my degree at college in. And I you know, decided, hey, I want to focus on marketing. And we wanted to improve the success of the stores. So I got highly involved in that. I opened up test market stores. I implemented back then, by the way, in 1985 was kind of the first time the Macintosh came out. So desktop publishing all started back then. So we implemented new services that I spearheaded. So my start was in family franchise business. But then I ended up leaving that and opening up a franchise marketing agency. So most of my experience in franchising was over the years. I've been in franchising 30 years, but most of that time I have been helping franchise companies grow up until four years ago when I started um, Smart Franchise Investing and helping people get into franchising. All right. So um, yeah, it's been a long career. I've done a lot. I've worked with hundreds of brands. I've worked with hundreds of people, you know, just in that place like, hey, you know, we're trying to get to the next level and trying to find that thing. So that's kind of my background. So, I mean, it's a very interesting background and a very rich history, but you mentioned that over the span of eight years, when you were getting started out fresh out of college, you helped to open over 500 stores. I mean, which is 
valuable experience that not many people can say that they have or not many people can say that they've done. So just during that journey and during that moment, what were some things, you know, some valuable lessons um, and consistencies that you saw throughout opening these businesses and, and, and making them successful? Well, I think that, you know, people go into business and they sometimes, um, they don't know what it's going to take. They have certain expectations, but they don't know what's required of them. Okay. And I'll tell you, when, when we look at business, there's a couple of sides to it. There's the intellectual side, knowing certain things, knowing what has to be done, knowing what's next, knowing these various steps that you have to make, right? There's the other side, the emotional side, okay? And, you know, fear gets in the way a lot with business people. You know, people get into business, it's scary. They're investing a, you know, big chunk of their life savings. If they don't succeed, it could hurt them, all right? Half the battle, half the, half the battle was working with these owners and saying and training them, but also coaching them to help them be successful, to realize that, hey, you can do this, but you have to you have to want it. You have to kind of push yourselves to the limit because a lot of people, they don't realize what they really could, ac could accomplish and they limit themselves. Sometimes that was the biggest challenge that I had is getting their mindset straight to be successful business owners because everything else was on paper. It was in a, you know, it was in an operations manual. It was, you know, we trained them on it. So at some point you have to, you know, basically find a way to make them stronger, to build up their confidence, to make them understand that the, uh, the difference between people that succeed and those that fail are the ones that get up and try every day and push for that. So I hope that answered your question. Absolutely. I mean, it, what would you say are some of the things that, that a person needs to know before buying a franchise? Well, that's a big question. So let's, let's try to tackle that. Um, first of all, I, I always tell my clients, understand really get get clear on what you want to do what what do you really want to accomplish all right so let me touch on the reasons why first okay let me touch on you know the reasons why somebody would get into a franchise would be a they're tired of their job they've been working their job 20 30 years and they're just burnt out and they want to change they you know they They've worked in the same company or in the same industry. And they're like, all right, I've done that. At some point, I, I didn't think I'd be doing this my whole life, right? Uh, some people, they've been working so hard and they look at their retirement and they haven't made enough money, right? So they're like, I better do something. I only got 10 or 15 years left of working. Maybe they're 50 years old and saying, oh my God, you know, I haven't gotten close enough to my retirement. And nowadays, if you don't have retirement savings, it's I think, you know, based on what we're seeing out in the world, it's going to be very hard to get by, right? You don't want to just, uh, I, you know, too many people are worried about their future based on we're losing value in, in our uh, 401ks right now. This past year has been terrible, right? But the other thing is this, um, some people always just wanted to own a business, that's, you know, they, they always wanted to do this. So they decided finally, hey, I'm going to do it. Some people are trying to build a legacy for their family, for their kids, right? Find a business that I could uh, have my son or my daughter join me in business and then turn it over to them, right? And many people, they don't want to work as hard as they, as they have. And what happens if you lose a job when you're 55 or 60 years old? Unless you were like a CEO of a company and easily could find another CEO role, most people have a tough time finding jobs at 60 years old, right? Or you get a job and maybe you could be fired in two years. And at six years old, who wants to deal with that? So finding a business is key. So now let me touch on the, the, the original question you had. 
was all right how should you investigate it what's the right due diligence look like what what should i look into so you know first of all again knowing why you're doing it get clear on that okay b there's all kinds of franchises out there at all kinds of you know financial levels right and what most people do is, A, they want to find the right match for them. And, and it's hard to know that, all right? And, and I help them there. By the way, that's one of the things that I do, right? But the other thing is, is you have to look at a franchise organization. So here's some key things when I look at a franchise organization that I'm looking for, all right? Number one, leadership. You want leadership that has a vision that our... Um, really committed that they've created what I call momentum, okay? So if if what is momentum? Well, in business, it's growth, right? It's continued growth. So in like your Subway, if we looked at year-over-year -year sales for every franchise in the system of Subway and you saw continual increases, that would mean like, hey, this company has momentum. Now, how do they create momentum? Maybe it's in the limited time offers that they've, this new positioning they've done. And right now, Subway has some really neat things they're doing, right, in regards to that. So um, maybe it's in, you know, uh, new technology they've been able to, you know, that that creates more, um, more cut, you know, more ability to serve customers faster, you know, and whatever. I mean, there's so many different ways to create momentum within a company, but it's also about culture there. So number one, what is the leaders? Who the who are the leaders? How are they creating momentum? What's their vision for growth? Okay. Number two, why do the customers love the brand? Okay. I mean, if I own something, I want to understand why the customers love it and what's it mean to the customers. Another thing, like training and support, key. If I was never in that industry, I want to make sure that I could get up and running pretty quick and I could learn it and it's something that I can learn. And here's what's crazy. Most franchise companies, they don't want people that really were in the industry before because a lot of those people already are set in their ways. They think they know how to do something. They'd rather teach somebody to own a subway. They don't want the guy who also is going to be a great sandwich maker. They want a guy who's going to be the business, hiring people, managing it, getting the word out. So, but training and support is key. Technology, I would look at technology. Today, now than ever, more than ever, like if you're a customer, you kind of expect that you're going to be able to go and somehow, you know, use technology to make things easier for yourself. Technology is key. And then marketing, super key. You know, how do you get more customers? How do you get more clients? Whatever that may be, whether it's a retail business or a service company, you know, what have they done or what vendors do they have in place to help you with sales? Because most people don't know how to generate sales. Okay. They could handle customers, they could handle sales, but getting the initial person in the door. How, how does that happen? And what is the franchisor doing in that respect or what vendors they have? So these are all the things that you would want to look at when you're buying a franchise, okay? And there's a lot more detail there, but um, I hope that was a good overview. No, absolutely. I mean, it, you know, you work with, with uh, hundreds of, of franchisors and uh, franchise owners what would you say are some important attributes of a great franchiser? Well, again, I think um, vision is key, as I talked about. Having that vision of where they're going to go with this franchise, where, where do they fit in in the competitive landscape? What does the brand look like five or 10 years down the road? How does it maintain relevancy? Some of these old brands... You know, you've seen old brands that haven't been able to change with the times and new brands come out and overtake them, okay? Um, great franchisor has strong infrastructure, okay? So here's the thing I think that everybody has to understand about franchising too. Franchises 
are born from entrepreneurs. So if we even take McDonald's, the McDonald's brothers, I guess, you know, had a great way, systematic approach to delivering hamburgers that was, you know, kind of like Henry Ford's system for building Model T's. Everything was done in a very quick fashion. And, you know, and there was a person every step in the process to do it, right? So you have entrepreneurs that are creating franchises, right? The problem is, is that some of these are great and some are just, you know, emerging or they're not great yet. Or so the problem exists is there's 3,500 to 4,000 franchises out there, all right? There are... Uh, some great, what I call legacy brands that everybody knows like Subway. And then there are new new franchises out there that are trying to grow and build their infrastructure. And, you know, I look at franchise companies and as I investigate them, uh, you know, I want to know, like if someone pays a royalty and we should touch on the costs of franchising, uh, but when somebody's paying an ongoing royalty, you know, then you're like, well, what do I get for that? six seven percent of sales all right so those things that are going to be important like uh like i said leadership growing a strong culture staying competitive building your brand okay implementing the right technology great technology investing in technology the marketing side training support finding right locations these are attributes of, of a great franchisor Okay. The problem is, is that you have all these different franchise companies in different stages of their evolution. Some have gotten fantastic and some just aren't so good. So there's like half the franchises that I would probably say I wouldn't, I would never invest in them because they're not there yet. But there's some great franchise companies and, and sometimes you have newer franchises. It doesn't mean you can't get with a newer franchise system. It's just that you have to investigate them and evaluate them properly, right? So it's not the like, hey, I'd only go with someone that has been around for 10, 20 years. No, because sometimes there's a great idea. And if you don't buy the territory that you're in, someone else will. And then you won't even have the opportunity if you want to stay in the same market you, you've been in or, you know, you live. So. No, those are awesome. Great points. Um, I mean, you mentioned an important you mentioned an important piece um, mentioning financing and, and costs. So, you know, what I want to ask is what are the typical costs and fees related to franchise ownership? Okay. Well, first of all, um, every franchise is going to have what they call an investment range. So let's say it's two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars investment range. Okay, now if you picture a spreadsheet and you have the line items, okay, and you may have in that line item, depending on the franchise, if it was a subway, you know, you're going to have uh, expenses for the site location. You're going to have a sign you need to put up. You're going to have equipment that goes in. You're going to have the seating and the build out of the store. You may have uniforms. You may have. So there's all these different things that, you know, depending whether you're building the subway in New York City or you're building it in Kansas, you know, you're going to have these costs associated. Now they have a high and a low number because those costs could vary based on where you're in in the country and what size of store you have and some other cost of labor and so on, right? So there's an investment range. In the investment range, included in that range, they typically have a franchise fee. Now, when you sign up and become a franchisee, everybody pays a franchise fee. It's a one-time fee you pay the franchise. Typically, it's forty to $50,000. Let's call it $50,000, okay? Because mostly it is. You're paying them $50,000 one-time fee. It's in that in initial investment range, all right? But that's not the big number. The bigger number is the royalty. So you have, you may see a royalty of a 6%, a 7%, an 8% royalty, okay? The royalty is something you pay of gross sales. So if you did a million dollars, you're going to be paying, and you're paying 7% royalty, you're paying them $70,000 a year. 
okay? Most franchise agreements are for 10 years, okay? So that equals now $700,000. Now it's pretty big money, isn't it? So here's what you have to know. First of all, the first few years, you're not going to hit the big numbers yet. It's going to take you a while to get there, all right? But goes back to that thing I talked about is what is a what what value does a franchisor give to me for me to pay them seventy thousand dollars or seven percent or whatever it may be? It may be you know thirty five thousand dollars a year, half that, or it could be a little less. It really depends on the franchise. But either way, it's a very substantial number, bigger than a one time fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so I don't care if the the franchise uh, fee is forty thousand or fifty thousand. That ten dollar difference isn't ten thousand dollar difference isn't big. If it's a one or two percent difference in royalty percentage, you got something really big here. It's the difference between six and eight hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars is a big difference, right? So, what I what I uh, tell my clients, I say, okay. We have to look at this, you know, franchise organization. With Subway, they had so much brand equity, right? People know it, and people will come in the door. You open up the door, guess what? You don't have to market Subway that much, right? People will see it. It's convenient. They know it. You know, they're going to come in the door. But with an emerging brand, guess what? You're not going to have that name recognition, right? So um, so the costs is are typically an investment range, the franchise fees included in that, okay, you're going to have a royalty. And now there's a thing called a national brand fund. The national brand fund is everybody pays 1% to 2% of sales into the national brand fund. So the brand could create websites, develop marketing, all these things on behalf of all the franchisees. The national brand fund does, is not like local marketing and local placement, you're not going to get as much benefits locally out of it. So now you may have a 6% royalty plus 2% ad fund or a 7% royalty plus 2% ad fund. All of a sudden you're at eight, 9%. Yeah. Now here's another thing that you got to think about that's uh, going to kind of open your eyes, right? Let's say you have a business and you know you're paying let's use 7% royalty okay now let's say that business nets 20% net profit all right and let's say it's after paying the royalty for this circumvent so you pay everything you're netting 20% that's great you net 20% on any business that's a strong net profit okay a little above average you're paying 7%, 70,000. Let's say you did a million, right? So you're netting 200,000, but then you paid 70,000. Now, 7% 7 of all the sales seems like a little percentage, but if you take 7% of the 20%, now it becomes like 25% of, you know, the total, right? Because if you take the 20 plus the 70 or 27, it represents basically... 25% of the profitability. You have a, like the franchisor is really like a 25% partner. Like, like if you had a partner, you'd be paying your partner out of net profits, right? So basically just know that even though these little royalties seem like they're a little bit, but they're off of gross sales, in actuality, it's a high percentage of your net profit. Is it worth it? Well, if you have a higher, uh, if you lower your risk of losing, you know, of, of, of losing your business and you're trained and you could optimize sales and you have advantages that most people in the marketplace do not have, yes. But that comes with finding the right franchise for, for you and making sure that this franchisor really has the, the people, the systems in place so you can be successful. Exactly. And it's like you're getting a chance to um, profit off of their brand name, off of off of uh, off of the platform that they've built and they've created. So um, I definitely think it's a, it's a beneficial and a good investment. But, you know, something that I want to ask is that, you know, the markets are down right now. A lot of people are 
uh, predicting economic downturns and, and, and a recession within the next few months, or maybe that could even last the next few years. So I want to ask, which types of franchise are the most recession proof? Well, listen, um, good question. Good question. First of all, a lot of people that I'm working with, think about this, they have 401ks, right? And they're seeing the markets like, and, and from what we hear, the markets are going to take a nosedive. Now, hopefully that doesn't happen. But I think the potential is there for it to happen. So like I have clients right now that are cashing out their 401k. There's a, you could use your 401k, roll it into a different type of 401k where you could invest it in a business and not have to pay the penalties typically associated with selling your stocks because you're rolling it into a, just another investment vehicle, which allows you to invest in your own business and into a franchise. So that's a lot of people are doing that right now, as far as the types of franchises. All right. So it's what's going to be relevant. What's going to be important. What, what does everybody need? Like what, what can't they like not do without in regards to services? Okay. Now, let me ask you something. If your pipe broke in your house and you it was flooding, what would you do? You'd call a plumber. All right. You probably call a plumber that you know and 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 you know the brand name, and you could say, Oh, they're gonna fix it right. I don't have to worry. I'm gonna call the, you know, uh, you know, I'm gonna call this plumber because they they do it like, you know, Ben Franklin Plumbing is a great, you know, uh, franchise um, for that. And they'll come out, they'll fix it. You could trust them. That's recession proof. People need home services, right? People need to bring their children to child care, daycare. There's daycare franchises. There's education. People are still going to want to educate. Now, some people may not, I guess, you know, but I think a lot of communities, yes. Cars will continue to break down. Meineke, Mako, Midas. Cars will still need tires, big old tires, right? I could say people will need to eat, but they could eat home more. So maybe not that, right? Will people not go get their hair cut if there's a recession or that will they still you know, go to supercuts or great clips or sport clips, right? I think they'll still go, even with a recession, um, because most people can't cut their own hair and wouldn't trust like a family member or friend, right? So, I mean, there are uh, things like that. There's uh, medical related franchises that tend, whether it be pain relief, um, uh, there's even right now a really neat one that does mental health. Like think about where we're at in, in the world and everybody who's having problems, whether it, it's family problems, girlfriend problems, career problems. I mean, mental health, what a great, you know, recession proof business, right? So um, just a lot of different neat categories that you could actually see probably an uptake on some of these areas, whether, you know, we go in a recession or not. But I think people will be losing jobs. I think people are going to be looking for options. They need to control their destiny, right? You can't be in a job, scared to get fired. And then what happens when you get fired? You got to have a backup plan. Now, like I said, if you open up your own business, most people don't know how to really do it and do it right and succeed. And that's why 80% of those businesses tend to fail. So hope that was helpful. Absolutely. How do you define success as an entrepreneur? I think I do it a little differently than many, okay? I think that there's, um, well, I have, ever since I left the family business and been in business for myself, you know, there's reasons why people do this, all right? And there's different ways they gauge, you know, success. And I think it's a little bit unique to any 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 one person, but we all share things, obviously. So number one, I like to get up every day and do what I do, right? Mm -hmm. How great would it be? And they, you know, you've heard it. 
you know, if you if you do what you love, it's not like you're not working a day in your life. Okay. Now I love to do what I do, but I'm working pretty hard to do it for my clients, right? But having that passion and be able to fulfill that passion and be in something you love, that's a big gauge of success. So there's that, uh, obviously money, you know, you have to be able to not only pay yourself what you can make out in the, you know, open market. So I work with a lot of people and they're like, well, I've been making $120,000 a year, you know, I've capped up, you know, capped off at about 120. I may see very slight increases, but I'm not going very far from here. But but how do I grow? And I said, well, listen, um, wh where would you like to be five years from now? What could that look like for you? All right. And, and they'll usually say, oh, you know, I want to be oh, two, three hundred thousand dollars you know if they were making 120 they'd like to get to 200 they'd like to make a little more and i say well we could do that okay but you're gonna have to scale to a second store and you're gonna have to learn how to hire people and manage people and be able to and that's how you grow because you see everybody's seen these guys that own you know five mcdonald's or you know, there's a guy here in Las Vegas that owns 14 Meinekes. He started with one five years ago. He, he owns 14 of them, okay? So you just have to, you know, put yourself in a position to, you know, in the right franchise to grow. So gauging success, uh, listen, making more money than you did before I can't really say an exact number, but being happy that you're making more money that you were capable of making before and whatever you did, you got to be happy, okay? And you have to find balance, all right? That's another key thing as you get older and as you realize, like, not everything is work, right? And society, the way society has developed this culture we have here in the U.S., you really got to work hard to get ahead. And so everybody says, well, how do you work smarter, right? So working smarter is being able to uh, kind of change the path that you've been on and saying, hey, I could do this and I'm going to and I'm going to make it happen. Now, here's another thing. A lot of people are driven not by money but by achievement. They always wanted to open a business because they knew that they could be successful if they did that. Now, they got to be smart, you know, but like, I don't know about you, but I think most people, and I know I have it, I've always wanted to push myself on the achievement side, learn, get better, say, yes, I did this. It feels good when you do that, right? There's not as much of that nowadays in corporate America. Definitely not anymore. You're capped off. You got someone telling you, you know, it's just not a positive. Now, not all companies are terrible about that, but there are, you know, it's hard to find those fantastic companies that really promote achievement, personal achievement, you know. Exactly. So those are, that's how I judge success. I hope that was helpful. Absolutely. How would you like for people to remember you and the company that you've created? Well, the biggest thing that I, I tell people is that um, I'm here to help you investigate franchising to see if it makes sense for you. I'm not here to sell franchises. I don't do that. I educate people about franchising and what it takes to buy a franchise and all those steps involved in that. OK, I work with them to identify what franchise options could be the best fit for them. I have this, you know, really successful process that I've developed over time that makes it easy for them and easy for me to get the information I need to be able to say, OK, based on everything I learned about you and based on even your preferences, because we talk about those things, you know, what do they like, you know, and 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 and. and and, and so we get into a deep discussion and we brainstorm. And then ultimately what I'm trying to do is find them brands that help them reach their goals, you know, that are very smart and make the most sense for them. So, you know, I want them to realize that, A, 
I'm never going to push them into buying a franchise. I'm here to educate them. We'll find out what brands make sense. And then I'm, you know, then once we do, they get to make the choice who they want to talk to and start discussions with. And then I help them in that process, you know, because they're going to come up with questions. You know, this is a new area for most people. So I'm there to guide them and consult them through this process. And I'm never here going to tell them what to buy. I don't pressure them. I'm really here to guide them. Um, and let me say this, you know, in regards to how I make my living, because, you know, I want people to realize this and what I do. It's it's similar to real estate. So when you buy a house and you're using a real estate agent, the buyer doesn't pay the agent commission, the seller does. So if I find a great franchise for someone and they decide to move forward, then yes, I earn a referral commission. But all the franchisors pretty much pay the same. And I would never pick a franchise that I didn't feel very confident that it was a good fit for my client. I don't worry about, I know it may sound you know, funny or, you know, I don't know. I don't worry about whether somebody's going to buy. I work with everybody the same. I, I want to help people do what's in their best interests. And so, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm, I've done well in my lifetime. I don't have to, I don't worry about that. I just work with people and I help, I help them figure this out. Absolutely. And what does the future of smart franchise investing look like to you? Listen, um, I'm going to continue to grow this company, um, help amazing people find their futures, grow my team over time, and just be a source of education and assistance, making sure people don't make big mistakes, costly mistakes that cost them their future. So, you know, I, uh, you know, doing various outreach programs and just building my brand personally but you know i want to it's it's just as important to build a reputation you know the brand reputation um so that's kind of my focus over the next 10 years marty thank you so much for your time today i really enjoy you know getting to hear your expertise and getting to learn more about the benefits of being a franchise owner and you know some of the some of the pros that come with that so thank you for sharing your knowledge and this information and i really appreciate your time yeah i appreciate that you know if anybody wants to you know look into what i do again take a visit uh smartfranchiseinvesting.com and you know there's various ways through that website you know to get in contact with me okay but thank you good luck to everybody i know we got some tough times coming ahead of us but I wish you the best of success. And if you want to have a discussion, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to. Awesome, man. Thank you so much.